Okay, uh, looks like we are officially live. Uh, so thank you so much to everybody for joining us and thank you for our patience, your patience. Um, <laughs> so uh, my name is Emma Perestoyer. I use she, her, hers, hers uh, pronouns and I'm the executive director of Union Hall. Uh, I'll just kick us off with some introductory remarks and then I will hand it over to Kali and Krista um, to get into the real conversation. Um, Union Hall is a nonprofit arts exhibition space uh, in Denver, Colorado, and we support emerging artists through uh, rotating exhibitions and creative experiences. Uh, this is our second uh, talk in a new series called Reunion, uh, and that's a new monthly program from Union Hall, uh, which focuses on building community across all of Denver's creative fields. And we pair two uh, Denver-based creatives from different industries, discipline, or or mediums together uh, to learn more about their different practices, uh, what connects them and uh, what keeps them connected to Denver. Um, a quick thank you to our generous sponsors, the Colorado Community Foundation and the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts, uh, both of whom are supporting all of our programming this year. Um, and I'm gonna hand it off now to our two wonderful speakers, uh, Carissa Semeniego, who we have actually worked with previously at Union Hall uh, for an exhibition in 2019, and Kali Fajardo Anstein, um, who is a local author. Um, and even though you're both from dis different disciplines um, and different fields, I feel like there's so much that connects your work thematically. And I'm really excited to hear you dig into it a lot more. Um, for those who are joining us on our YouTube channel, uh, the, just a reminder that there will be a Q&A at the end. So if anyone has any questions throughout the talk, um, please feel free to leave them in the chat box on YouTube and we will get to them towards the end of the talk. Um, and yeah, I will let Chris and Kali kick it off now. Uh, and thank you both for being here. Awesome, thanks Emma. Thanks so much for having us. Hey, Carissa. Hi. Hi, Kelly. Hey. How are you? <laughs> I'm, I'm okay. It's good to see you. I, I feel like I haven't like FaceTimed you or Zoomed at all. So this is like, it's a new way of seeing you. I know. I know. It's so true. I knew you in the real world. Yeah. I knew you back when things were, when things were real. Yeah. Uh, when you're, you had a show at Union Hall and I live, I used to live right over mm -hmm. there. So I like walked over. And so that was one of the last times I got to see you. <laughs> I know. Yeah. But also, but, you know, it's interesting because that we like come back here because I think I had read your book. Um, when did Sabrina and Karina come out? It came out in April of 2019. Okay. So I had recently yeah. just, I think I had recently read your book and um, was, was so excited about it and the content of it. And so there was, um, it was a good time to have met each other when our, and through Union Hall when our creative um, ideas were overlapping, or I guess that Union Hall similarly came into the mix, I should say. Yeah. yeah. Um, so to begin, do you want to tell people who you are and what you make? <laughs> like give yeah. Them, yeah, <laughs> that might be fun. <laughs> that sounds great. Okay, so um, like Emma said, I, I have had an exhibition at Union Hall before, so I'm a visual artist. Um, Primarily, like my background is in um, three-dimensional media, so somewhat of an object maker. Um, and my work um, is, I, I sort of see myself as a storyteller um, in my work, a visual storyteller. And my work often talks about my own experience um, growing up having mixed identity, growing up um, sort of oscillating between two different places, um, uh, rural Minnesota and Southern New Mexico. And just it's like sort of wanting to have a voice for that experience in the world. And um, I do that through um, telling story or, or using objects that create stories about my own experience, about the places that I grew up and about um, other like historical, cultural um, traditions or histories that um, can sort of tell a more complex narrative about identity than a very linear, linear one. Um, yeah, so that's not very concrete information, but that's at least a lot of like 
content to talk about. <laughs> and then if we, like, we want to, yeah. I can describe, I can describe some of the work too, but those are yeah. what the ideas are. No, mm -hmm. I, I love it because I had to write, um, like an artist statement when I graduated from my MFA and I have like used that as like the master document of how to talk about my own work for like 10 years mm -hmm. now. So like mm -hmm. when I was looking mm -hmm. at your artist statement, I was like, okay, I get it. This is awesome. But I also was excited about how much overlap. Like we could have written each other's statements. Like, yes. <laughs> like there's so much there that, um, uh -huh. that I think we uh -huh. share. So that was really cool. Agreed. Agreed. <laughs> and I think, I think also probably around the time um, when I was reading Sabrina and Karina, like I was realizing how important um, like, matriarchal figures have been in my life like you know for for good and for bad but like how um like just they've been such like powerful figures you know and, and have such powerful stories and um and you know I have sisters and um yeah so I just I I, I really loved your book and Aww, so um <laughs> yeah let's so um let's talk about what you since there is some similar conceptual overlap. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely was like, I did, I mean, it's interesting because you can know people and then you just, you don't know too that you have, you have overlap in the frameworks of how you approach your work. And so today yeah, I was, yeah. I was like watching some old YouTube videos with you. And at one point you said, you learn more about my work by listening to me talk about it. And I was like, yeah, because I feel like when in like writing school, they told us like your work should always speak for itself. But I was mm -hmm. like, well, sometimes there's like more I want to add. Um, but to, to add more to like the framework of what I do, mm -hmm. I'm a short story writer and a novelist. And I, I am a storyteller. Um, I'm, I am like a second generation storyteller, but Beyond that, I'm forever generation storyteller. But my mother, Renee Fajardo, is a writer and also an artist. Um, and so she was working a lot with family stories when I was growing up. And I, I kind of rejected that in a lot of ways when I was younger. I thought like it didn't really have anything to do with me. But then when I started making my own work, when I felt compelled to start telling stories, I realized that there was a ton of overlap in um, the kinds of things my mother was interested in. And that had to do with just placing ourselves in this larger Southwestern context, how our identity is layered as people who are mixed with indigenous mm -hmm. roots from mm -hmm. the place where we still are. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, it was really sort of a strange experience going from like being an angry teenager and thinking I had nothing in common with my mom. And then suddenly realizing like, I'm a continuation of the storytelling female tradition in my family. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm a novelist, short story writer. I also do a lot of speaking. Um, and now I, I talk to groups of people and next year I'll be a professor at Texas State. And yeah, and I'm a big sister to like five people and I'm a younger sister to one. And, and I have a lot of nieces and nephews and just like a big family. And we've been in Denver um, since the 1930s on my mother's side when they left Southern Colorado and Northern New Mexico. And I'm a mixed person. I have a lot yeah. of different ancestry, so. <laughs> um, so I've been, I, I have been doing a lot. I mean, there's a number of Fajardos in New Mexico, but I have been doing a lot of my own um, ancestral research, looking for stories and materials and objects and, um, you know, things that like sort of are the connective, the connective matter that, um, you know, can, can tell the stories that I'm trying to tell about these, you know, current voices and future voices that um, are experiencing these mixed identities. But um, one thing I, I keep coming across is uh, in last names that are like in censuses by where, where my family was living is Fajardo last name. Oh, and I was wow. like, Kelly and I have distant re relatives. <laughs> Maybe, well, my Fajardo comes by way of Spain through the Philippines. Because my great grandfather is Filipino. Oh, interesting. So, but, th but they could be, I mean, they could be the same yeah, yeah, yeah. one conquistador that like, went to all these different <laughs> places. That, yeah. you know, and Gloria Stefan, her maiden name is Fajardo. So I really? like, I yeah, that. I know that's kind of like a, a weird aside, but yeah. we probably are cousins somewhere on the line. Definitely. <laughs> um, but I also like, that makes me yeah. super interested to, I want to meet your mom. You've got to, you got to, 
we should have coffee we should, or something. We'll have we'll do that. We'll she doesn't that. really she would more like a, a glass of iced wine than coffee, okay. but All right. <laughs> she, we can do that. Can do um that. but yeah, <laughs> she she's like an interesting like forest in Denver and mm -hmm. um She's running Chicano Humanities and Arts Council right now as one of the co-chairs. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. So we will introduce and I think, you. <laughs> that sounds great. And I think that actually is another thing that's um, central to our work is family. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. you're getting a lot of your content from your family and your research into your family. Um, and you're a lot, you're like sort of, um, what would I say? Like embracing the influence that our parents are on our, on us and our identities and like who they've um yeah what they've what they've given to us um or what you know we can give to the next generation because of them and like how that you know continuation is but that that i think about that my, a lot in my work um my dad um, is trained as a gunsmith and my mom is a um like quilter sewer by you know she was a teacher by like her her career was a teacher but um in terms of like making and arts and visual art there those things come into my practice a lot and um it, for like the tactile qualities but what I always love in in doing that is remembering their stories like their oral stories that they're telling me you know like while we do these things together or while they're teaching me something or and so um I one question I had for you is like what what relatives do you look to or, um, you know, do you have an example of like, you know, a character in your family? Like, I'm just thinking of like my uncle Ray, who, who like, you know, like, yeah, who do you, who are you always yeah. looking at? Watching, yeah, who are you watching? <laughs> well, first of all, I want to say, I, I, I found out that your, your dad was a gunsmith. And I thought mm -hmm. that was really fascinating because in my new book, one of the main characters is a sharpshooter in really? the, yeah, yeah. Like around 1900, late 1890s. Her name is Simodicia. And I had to go look at guns. Hey. Oh, oh there's, cool. oh, there's like a sweet hug. <laughs> hey, um, I had to go look at guns at History Colorado, like these old, like, and some of them have these really crude names, like, the guns that won the West. So I just thought that was really fascinating that you had that in your family. Um, so for family members of mine, my Auntie Lucy. So she lived at 8th and Gallipago when I was growing up. And she was sort of the matriarch of our family, especially after my great grandma passed away. And my Auntie Lucy is, she shows up in a lot of my work. She shows up in Sabrina and Karina. Sort of anytime there's like a pretty strong um, grandmother character, that is usually like I'm incorporating things from my Auntie Lucy. Um, but she, she obviously, oh, it's quite, <laughs> This is so sweet. Sorry, you guys. I'm so sorry. She's home sort of unexpected, or I'm with her sort of unexpectedly. Yeah. So um, yeah. she's she's joining the call. So, I mean, guess good That's timing. Okay. We're talking about family. This, okay. this is my this is my um, four year old daughter. She can't let hear you though because I have my <laughs> earbuds in. But oh. um, but this is my four this is my four year old daughter Coralie. There Hi Coralie. Hi Coralie. You can go check on Teresa. <laughs> you can go see if Teresa's home, honey. I just thought I'd, go, I'd go uh, check, check in in case uh, you needed to hop off for a second. I'm happy to talk to Kali for Thank you. Minutes. Well, I think she's she's going to go to put some shoes on and go check on. We have a cousin next door that she's going to go run over. Um, so okay. then I think we'll be okay. But yeah, okay. thank you. Sounds I, good. I of course. No up. problem. Yeah. Hey, I could, I also do not mind Corley being in the call. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> yeah, I can talk well, to she her. she really likes to. She's like. Oh, she's really? very chatty. Oh, <laughs> she yeah. I mean, chat. I remember she showed me all her colored pencils one time. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. yeah. That was really exciting. <laughs> um, someday she's going to be an artist and she's going to talk about uh, the relatives in her life that inspired her. And she's I know, like, right? She's like, my mom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, what about you? Like, what, like, 
you, you talked about your dad a little bit, but I also know your grandma has mm -hmm. like a lot of influence in your work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my grandmother who lives, who we're at, I'm actually in her house. She, she's no longer alive, but my dad now lives in the house. Um, so, so we're on, fa I'm on family property. Um, and, um, and she's one of the matriarchs I was, I was talking about, but she was like a pretty, um, like in, a hardcore Catholic, um, but of the Nuevo Mexicana kind. So there's like a bit of, um, like indigenous, um, spiritual influence and like, uh, Mexican folk traditions, like in with the cat, like the, yeah, New Mexican Catholic. Um, but she always sees, actually, we're sitting right in front of it. Oh, really? Oh my wow. gosh, that tree, <laughs> oh, that wow. tree right there. That's the tree. Oh my gosh. That's the tree. Tell that them the, the story. <laughs> okay. Oh my gosh. I've actually never been able to do this before. How cool. <laughs> this, is so cool. So this, is, this is the mulberry tree that I've made, uh, that I made a bunch of work about for Union Hall. Um, and that, I guess I can kind of see it now that I'm looking at it from the camera, but my grandma used to see the Virgin Mary in that tree. And she would like yell at us and be like, the Virgin is here. The Virgin is here. And like, you know, um, she had kept this disposable camera in her drawer and with this is when I was young she's been gone for a long time now but she would like want us to look at it and take a picture and then we couldn't she'd be like no you idiot like that's not where it is and we're like I don't see the virgin what are you talking about <laughs> but we have like lots of camera lots of photos of this tree because of my grandma seeing the virgin in it but also just like I think um yeah and I made work about how her memories um, kind of tell this story about New Mexico and about the complex identity here. So, you know, her seeing the Virgin in this mulberry tree, um, I sort of interwove with the story of her seeing the first atomic bomb when she was working her fields outside of Hatch. Um, so like just trying to, like I try to find moments like that, that can, um, yeah, I don't, I, I guess like pair personal, pair personal narrative with um, fact like I, in the way that like, a, um, what do they call it? Like a, a, a memoir that's not truthful, a fictional, fictional autobiography, what is it? Fiction. Something. I, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Fiction inspired by truth. Is that what it there says at the beginning of like, like, I don't know, like a crew try movie, they'll be like, these are inspired by true events. Yeah, 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 I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I, People sometimes ask me like, how much of my work is truthful versus how much is made up? And I'm like, well, it's it's all it's all true and it's all made up because if like I change one little thing, it's becoming its own new mm -hmm. universe, but it's also mm -hmm. like reverberating within the reality that I already mm -hmm. is in. So that's fascinating. I I really love that learning about how much you base your work on family and family stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm super interested in this character. I can't wait to tell my dad. He's good. He like geeks out on that stuff so he would like talk to you about it for hours and hours yeah. but um, he'll want to read the book too so yeah and I like I pulled her name because you know I'm sh like if your family has these cool census records where there's just all these incredible names mm -hmm. these mm -hmm. old New mm -hmm. Mexican names so mm -hmm. Simodicia is like an actual ancestor of mine I don't know if she was a like a gunslinger sharpshooter mm -hmm. in the old west but mm -hmm. that's how she like revealed herself to me um but I, you know, when people have read the new novel, I'm like, what do you guys think? You know, and like, they'll say they like this, this, and this. I'm like, what about Simodicia? Like, <laughs> I think she's so cool. But yeah, I had to look at all these old guns. <laughs> that is, that's really awesome. Yeah, there's a gun, uh, the, the school in Trinidad has a, oh, I have to go off Corley for a second. Actually, okay. Emma, I am going to okay. have you step in here. I'm so sorry. Hey, Hi there. Hi. Hey. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? I am I'm the new good. Carissa for the time being. <laughs> Sounds good. Just to pretend that I'm her. <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah, that's really exciting about your upcoming book. When is it uh, being released again? Um, I'll announce that soon, probably in the next okay. couple of weeks. But um, yeah, hey. this is this is really interesting. So, what other artists have you had do a reunion so far? Um, well, just last month was our first one. So we had uh, oh, cool. Justin, who's um, a local interdisciplinary artist who 
uh, was working uh, with Meow Wolf and then uh, two artists, Frankie and Theron, who uh, both of them uh, worked on one of the rooms in Meow Wolf and uh, now, or no, in different rooms. And now they're working on a new project called Rainbow Dome, uh, which we're really excited about, which is a roller skating. Uh, it's going to be a, a roller skating rink uh, with a bunch of visual art as well. So, oh, how yeah. fun. That's exciting. And then yeah. do you have, you have more of these coming up and in-person events or is it sort of right now as a digital virtual virtual. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right now, this is uh, mainly just our virtual events, but we do have a lot of in-person events. Uh, this is sort of an extension of what we do in person in the gallery, where um, while we're in the gallery, we do a lot of different interdisciplinary events like concerts and poetry readings. And so this is sort of uh, an extension of that in which we you know, are bringing different artistic disciplines together, um, but trying to have more conversations about what connects all of those different works. Because we hear so much of that in our space of people talking about how um, music feels so similar to them and as painting and um, as writing. And so um, I think it's really interesting to hear those connections and between you and Carissa, um, I love hearing about it. I'm part Mexican as well. And um, I feel like re relate to a lot of the themes throughout your work. So it's really fun for me to hear more about and um, oh, hear more cool. about like the inspiration behind your work. So, yeah. Cool. <laughs> great. Yeah, I do um, a lot of residency. So like at McDowell and Yotto, and it's always interesting to be around the other artists there and just get to talk to people across disciplines. So this is a treat. Yeah. Hey, Carissa. <laughs> Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Sorry about that. That's um, okay. I, did, I, was, I was listening, so I did get to hear. Um, <laughs> and I, I think I have a good, I have some questions actually that your conversation prompted because um, I did, I think like that's, this is one really, so in my work, and in fact, when I did the show at Union Hall, I collaborated with another a writer well he, he included a piece of writing um that was like uh thematically conceptually connected to what I was doing after I read his book um that was about southern New Mexico his name is Josh Wheeler and he wrote this book called Acid West and it's really great and so I and I because I like to have these like multiple voices trying to tell the same story or not the same story but have multiple voices be a part of the story and, and that's what I always love about reading. Like I read a lot of books and that's, I find books more in, influential to my own work than other artists or visual artists. Um, but, uh, and then this, in this last project I did, I worked with a, a musician. And I think what you're saying about trying to pair different disciplines together um, at Union Hall, um, I think it's something that doesn't happen enough in Denver or in like in our community, in the Colorado community, um, we seem to be kind of pretty siloed. And I think it's one of the ways that like, you can find, um, I don't know, really, um, yeah, I guess new ways of looking at things, but yeah. So I just, I just appreciate that. And um, yeah, that's all. <laughs> yeah. No, I think, I think it's so important. And like one of my favorite writers, he, he said that, you know, at this point, he's like an old man. So he said, it was in an interview. He didn't tell me this personally, but he, he said something like, I'm most inspired by music at this point, because mm -hmm. it's not like if you've been writing fiction for 70 years, it's like, he was like, what am I going to learn? Like, I know you can always keep learning, but it's jogging different ideas and new concepts through listening to different forms mm -hmm. and engaging with different forms. Um, and I think like visual art is incredibly important to me. That's partly why the original cover has a visual artist, Gustavo yeah. Rimada on the cover. Um, and like a lot of my fans have actually like made art inspired by Sabrina and Karina. Okay. And I've seen like different forms, like I saw cross stitch, like somebody actually like did a whole cross stitch of like the cover. Wow. Yeah. And just like cakes. You know, like really what? cool. Yeah, like really cool. Just beautiful, inspirational work. Somebody painted my great auntie Dodie, who's a character in the novel. And uh, she had like tree, I mean, she was blinded in the story and she has trees like coming out of her eyes in the painting. And I just was like, this, this is it. Like, this is why we make art. It's so there can be all kinds of other art in conversation with us. 
Um, totally. So what that's what brings me to one of my questions. Mm -hmm. When did you know you wanted to be an artist or did you always know? I think the question is either, the answer to that question is either I always knew or I still don't know because it, like, because, <clears throat> um, because um, I, so I grew up in a really small town um, and then, and I didn't know that like artists were alive. Um, like all artists knew were dead, which actually I think is, I thought was like, like I felt very foolish for a while, but then I gave tours at a sculpture park to kids and a lot of them would be like, is anyone alive? And I'm like, yeah, all these artists are alive. So I think it's like a thing. Like we, at, at public schools, we tell our kids that artists are dead or something. Like, I don't know why we have that as our message, but that seems to be what we, um, what we, what we tell people. Um, but, uh, I, so I didn't know that was a, a job or a, a career or that you could do that. And then it wasn't until I went to college and I took an art history class and I was like, oh, um, there's like people, there, there's artists that are alive right now. <laughs> and, um, and then I took some art classes and then it kind of just kept going. And, and it, you know, I, I kind of hate the phrase or I don't hate, I shouldn't say that. I don't, but I dislike the phrase art is life. But I will say that I have found that art is a way of knowing for me. It's a way of knowing the world. It's a way of understanding the world. And, um, and it's a way of processing the world and sharing my knowledge with other people. So I think, um, I think, yeah, like it's either, it's either that I always knew I was gonna be an artist or I'm still not one because whatever I was before, I, yeah, I, I don't know. It's like, <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, yeah, I don't know, but I think, I think that the, that the way that I, um, experience the world or want to experience the world has been consistent, um, whether I knew I was going to be an artist or not. And it wasn't until college when I realized you could do it for a career. That's my, wow. that is my, yeah. But, That's um, fascinating. yeah, yeah. And Cause it's like, still, I would like, think, were you baking art though before college? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you yeah. always made and, and I'd always, yeah. And I'd always been like a very like, ha like tactical ha hands-on person, like taking things apart or putting things together or, you know, finding out how something works or, um, which is probably why I went to sculpture, um, you know, like building things and, um, and yeah, always making things and sewing, whatever, but not, I didn't really realize that that was like a way of communicating. I think that's what it is, actually. I think that I used to think also that art was like to make things pretty, like, and that's all like, you know, and I didn't, yeah. I didn't understand it until I grew up or whatever. <laughs> yeah. What about you? Well, I'm glad did you know you wanted you. to be a writer. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm like a weirdo. I just knew immediately, but like, Did you? so I, yeah, so you always I, knew. I always knew, but I, um, so like in second grade, I wrote my first short story and then I got to go to like this kid's writer's workshop with like my, my oh. writing in a folder. And I think my dad picked me up and dropped me off. And like, I just was like, this is it. Like I'm going to go to writer's workshops, but I, um, I had like a pretty tumultuous time with school and, you know, I talk about that a lot, how I had actually ended up dropping out of high school. Yeah. And it's not, yeah. and it's not like, it, it's like being a writer and being a big reader is usually synonymous with being an amazing student. And since I didn't have that going, I, I didn't know exactly how to get to this idea of the career as author. Um, yeah. But another thing is like, I worked at an independent bookstore. I worked at Westside Books in Denver. Um, from the time I was 16 oh. off and on until I was 30. So I did know I wanted to be around books. Like in any way I could possibly be around books, I had to. Um, and that bookstore is used new now, but at the time it was just used in antiquarian books. And so I think that's what really kind of led me down the path of knowing how to research. Because I didn't like, I grew up with lots of objects like washboards, irons, miners' lamps, flapper dresses, like beaded pouches, like 
all kinds of objects from my ancestors, but I didn't grow up with books or like letters uh-huh. because uh-huh. probably um, I know for a fact that like my great auntie was not very literate. Um, mm-hmm. So that would have been, that would not have been possible for them to be writing like long letters to each other. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But so like mm-hmm. being around the bookstore world, I was like, oh, there's this whole other kind of knowledge that is, I can just access if I go and I, I try to research. Um, but yeah, I think it was actually like, I was, I was in my last semester or something of college at Metro State and somebody was like, yeah, you're pretty good at writing. Um, why don't you apply for these masters of fine arts programs? And I was like, well, I don't even know what that is. So, so I like, I did a quick like search and I was like, oh, I'll apply to like the 15 best in America. And, you know, not realizing it costs like $120 to submit. Yeah. And so it's like, it was mm-hmm. like a, over a thousand dollars I had to borrow from my family. And I was mortified because I didn't get accepted like anywhere. Um, mm-hmm. I got waitlisted and pulled off a waitlist in um, California. And that mm-hmm. was a really negative experience. And I dropped out again. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I'm a big dropper mm-hmm. outer. Um, but I, I do think that I think around that time, like when I came back home from California and I went back mm-hmm. to the bookstore, I think that's where I had this momentous, like, I'm going to make this my, my life. Like this will be what I do. And even though like the schooling is not working out, and even though I'm not getting accepted by literary journals, this will be my life's work and I'm really proud of it. Um, and so that kind of set off the path and then I wouldn't be published for like 10 more years. <laughs> it finally mm-hmm. happened. <laughs> um, well, we need to go to some bookstores together because yeah. book, going to bookstores is like my favorite. And I just went to um, West Side Books for the first time because I went to the um, funeral for Flaca reading. Oh yeah. Um, I love that and book. I do too. Oh my God, it's hilarious. <laughs> like cracks me up so hard. Um, but yeah, I was, I, cause I, I haven't really, uh, I haven't really, um, I don't know en- enough about Denver to be honest. So like, you know, saying that I've just been to West Side Books one time, um, <laughs> but you'll have to show, you'll have to show me all the good spots. Cause I do I love will. a good, a good you day like at a bookstore. We had, we have an Americana section. That was the first time I had heard the words Americana was because of our section. So I think you would like ah, it. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Oh, yes. Um, um, do you want to talk about your upcoming project a little bit, like before we transition into audience questions, if there are any, but I'm, I'm yeah. excited to hear about it. Yeah, and I, I think um, I wanted to hear, I want I had one more question for you, but um, it was related to something you said, but yes, I will. Um, so I have I have a couple upcoming projects. One is a, a residency at Platform, um, which is in Denver. And um, for that project, I'm, it's still sort of like, you know, it's coalescing as we, as, at the moment, but one thing I'm particularly interested in is like understanding the um, the story of the neighborhoods around that area, the um, Globeville, Illyria, Swansea neighborhoods, and how they're like being affected by the National Western Center and the I-70 construction. So I've been I've been kind of following that um, for a long time, and so that's one thing I'm interested in in looking into and seeing how we might who, how I might be able to work with some of the um, youth in the neighborhood to collect some of the stories about how that neighborhood's transforming that's one project and then I have another project um, that I'm doing this next year with um, some funding from Redline's uh, Insight Fund and um, I'm going to be working with a um, 1977 Ford Ranchero car. And um, it's the, pro- the project is actually transforming sort of this week as I speak because I'm um, repitching some of it just because of, um, I'm currently down in New Mexico and seeing all the like farming, um, the changes in farming that are gonna need to happen down here, uh, everywhere, everywhere over the next 10 years. But I've just been thinking about that. So the, the, the project is shifting a little bit, but there's two upcoming projects in Denver. Um, yeah, in, in 2022 that 
will be pretty fun. And you've got a, cool. a pretty big project coming up. Yeah. No, I'm like, I'm like, that's so cool <laughs> about all your projects. Um, when I was little, I did, I was in, I was an actress in Su Teatro. It was over in Hilarious oh. back then before they moved. And I remember mm-hmm. being like, it smells like the dog food factory as I was like, oh. <laughs> it does. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so I'm curious about that. You can add that to your neighborhood story, <laughs> little me in, in plays. Uh-huh. And we were told like uh-huh. if we summoned Bloody Mary at the building, like she was really gonna show up. Um, I wonder if that building is still there. Um, yeah, I have a new book coming out next year, and I I've been I've been working on it for ten years, and it's based on my family history and my ancestors. And it's sort of this big multi-generational sprawling epic. Um, It begins in 1868 and it ends in 1934 and it goes through uh, five five generations, but it primarily focuses on three generations of the same family. Um, And so I I wanted to write this novel before I wrote Sabrina and Karina. It was actually like the first things I started working on as a teenager. Um, And it was basically, it was my response to not having my ancestors migration or their lives at all inside American literature. Like there was nothing that really resembled us. And so I knew I wanted to tell like a really big story, but I didn't have the skill level um, that I needed. Uh, So I Mm -hmm. I wrote a lot of short stories. (laughs) So, Mm -hmm. and then I finally got to the point where I was like, I think, I think I can devote a bunch of time to this novel. Um, But yeah, a lot of the characters are based on my ancestors. So there's a, there's a snake charmer named Diego. He's based on my uncle Jake, who's also a snake charmer. Um, the matriarch is named Maria Josie, and she's this awesome butch lesbian in the 1930s who is based on my auntie Mary. And the main character is based on my auntie Lucy, and she's a tea leaf reader, and she has the sight. Um, and so I just... That'll be coming out next year. And I, I think my life might change a little when I become a novelist <laughs> um, because you know so many people won't give short stories a chance. They are like, no, I want yeah. a big book or this isn't exactly what my book club wants. So now I'm like, I wrote the big book, here you go. <laughs> but, <laughs> so we'll see what happens. But I, I also, it's just, it's wild that Sabrina and Karina keeps growing and I, I wrote some mm-hmm. of these stories when I was like, you know, 24 and incredibly depressed mm-hmm. and I'm not at that space anymore. So it's always interesting now mm-hmm. to, so I will always talk about that space because people really yeah. resonate with that work. So it'll be, yeah. it'll be interesting and new to be able to talk about the expansion of like my universe as a writer, if that mm-hmm. makes sense. I'm so excited about that. And I think The other reason, like the thing that I really appreciate about your work is, um, and what I try to do in mine is to give other origin stories for like, you know, like what you were just saying in terms of like your ancestors, like the United States um, is the reality of the United States, what we know today is really different from what you read in your fifth grade history book, you know, and um, and like you were saying, like you didn't, you couldn't find the stories of your family's migrations, migration um, history. You couldn't find that represented anywhere. Like my my family, who was in Las Cruces, we've lived here literally. Not, I'm not. I'm and I, I'm not using that term right. But we have factually lived here since, um, uh, you know like conquistador times like we've got documentation back into the 1600s <laughs> yeah. here yeah. so but when I when I was going to school in Minnesota people didn't understand that because the the or the mythology of America is that everyone came you were either there you're indigenous yeah. to the continent or you came from the east out you know yeah. and and so um yeah I'm just I'm so excited that you're gonna have that and and, and if and if it ever is told to if it ever is, is told from the West, it's always told from a male perspective or from like a cowboy perspective or whatever. So I'm really excited to hear. Um, I'm just so excited for your novel. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I think yeah. that was, you know, when I was reading about your work, that was something that really like struck me too, is like just the invisibility, like just there's no understanding about like the layers of, you know, the colonization that's happened on this land, the layers yeah. of trauma. 
Um, because again, mm -hmm. everything was like people from the East pushing West. Like I even as mm -hmm. a little kid would get upset when people would say somebody went back East because I'd be like, no one in my family has gone there. Like maybe like somebody <laughs> on my dad's side, my white side, but I was like, we're like in this corridor for like, as long as like we have recorded history. So right. it was always like perplexing to me. And just, uh -huh. yeah, even like learning, like basing everything off the pilgrims, like landing at Plymouth right. Rock was so perplexing right. to me because I was yeah, like, I know. we don't have this, like, this is not I a know. tradition in my family, but okay. Uh -huh. So, because yeah. we were I'm here excited about your like work a too. long time before that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah totally. exactly. And I, I loved, I, uh -huh. my, we, we have a mutual friend, Trent, and like, I would always tell Trent, like, these words are not adequate to describe my identity because they bring mm. up ideas about what that word means that not doesn't necessarily include totally. someone as mixed as I am. And he mm -hmm. was like, well, you're a place person. You're a person mm -hmm. where, like you have interacted with place for generations. Mm -hmm. And I, I just, I'm just so excited. Like artists like you and myself are like able mm -hmm. to talk about this now because I know in my mom's generation, you know, she used to say that she felt like she had no people because yeah. she went to law school and there were no clubs for her as a woman of color, but a woman of color who came from this incredibly blended woven identity. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have like 15 more minutes. So if there's like one, there's a question for us and we can get to that one now, if you'd like, <laughs> or we sure, can keep yeah. talking. <laughs> I think either way, Emma, tell, Tell me what's best because I, um, we can definitely Did you remember the question? Can... Did you remember the question no. you had? Okay. <laughs> no, not the one from earlier. Not the one from earlier, but um, no. It's okay. Do you have any other, do you have any dying questions? Well, uh, I don't think it's a question. I think it's just that like with the identity thing, because I think the reason, part of what drives my work is that it's not easy to say, like when somebody says, what are you? Which yeah. gets asked all the time, right? Yeah. Like I have an unusual last name. You have a very unusual last name. Um, so it caught all the time. What are you? What are you? What are you? And it's like, I can't, like I, because my family has been in this place for so long, like I can't really say that. I mean, yes, we technically were Mexican for like 20 years, Yeah. you know? And before that we <laughs> were like Spanish colonizers. And before that we were, um, and like indigenous and Spanish, you know, like all of this crazy, like, you know, there's a lot of, of mixed history. And like, if you ask my dad, um, you know, what, he, if you say like, Ron, where are you? He would be like, I'm Spanish, French and Indian. And I'm like, yeah. dad, like you can't, like, that's not really like how people, and he's like, I, I put Native American on my, um, all these forms that they want me to fill out. He's like, what even is Hispanic? I don't even know what that is. You know what I mean? Like, because because it's it's something that has been imposed to like collect yeah. all of the et cetera, you know, and yeah. and and it and it and it yeah, and it absolutely has like forced out like any in, indigeneity that like we we would would normally like feel a connection to, and uh, like my dad knows the land better than any person I know, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like in this place, um, and and um, but at the same time, like he's very much part of a colonizing history and like yeah. I mean it's it's so complicated and like yeah so I, I don't have a question I just have to say that like we have so much to keep talking about there yeah. you know like with all of the like layers of of, com of complex identity and with us continually becoming more divided and, and like misunderstood um you know in this in this country like it's yeah. So anyway, yeah. that's all. <laughs> well, I, I understand your identity struggle. So today when I, I was like, oh my gosh. And I think that's one of the things that's really exciting about my work having an audience now, because a lot of people in that audience are people like us that come from these yeah. like very complicated ancestral backgrounds. And they always, they'll come up to me and they, they'll say, you make me feel seen. And I'm like, you yeah. make me feel seen. Like this is like <laughs> this weird circle of like, I made the art and now like I get to meet people like you. And like, it's yeah. like our art is like bringing us to each other and we can find each other today. 
because yeah. I think one of the, I think one of the reasons for that, like sort of disappearance of the story of who we are was to control the land. And I'm totally. always curious about totally. like how our like narratives were replaced with new narratives. So mm -hmm. I'm just, I'm really mm -hmm. excited and happy you're making the work you're making. And I'm so glad that we found each other. <laughs> Thanks. Same. I feel the yeah. same. Thank you, Kali. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah I, I agreed. So Olivia I like asked dark if, is um, I like yeah. it. It's cool. It's like I watched you go okay. from day to night. Okay. Um, <laughs> I just flipped that. Okay. You do have a light on you, though. So, you look. so Olivia okay. asked us a question, which I think would be a, a good question for both of us. Uh -huh. um, uh -huh. They said, I love how you both feel so called by your ancestors. Are there any stories you feel especially called to tell? or any you want to tell, but haven't crafted perfectly yet? Yeah. Well, I have a lot, I would say. Like I have a lot of funny stories. I'll tell you the most recent one that made me laugh out loud. Um, so when, um, so my, so Las Cruces actually was founded uh, when the United States took over this, took, took over, after the, um, what am I saying here? Not the Gadsden Purchase. That was the one that settled the, after the Treaty of Guadalupe. That was what made this part the United States. So Las Cruces was founded then. Before that, there was Mesilla. But when Las Cruces was founded, because um, I've been, been reading about, about like, yeah, just the founding of this place. And um, there, was a, there was a street name called Samaniego because there was Samaniegos were, there, there was a family of us that were here. And I read in the newspaper, it was hilarious. Apparently there was only like four streets, but um, you know, we, the people building the houses were like, had lived here. They had, they had been um, living in this place for a very long time and built adobes and you were used to it and knew how to do it. Um, so they were given permission to like build houses. And so they started in on Samaniego street. And then in the newspaper, they wrote how, um, they had to like the, not the mayor, cause they didn't have a mayor. It was like the governor, I think of the state had to put out an order for them to like stop building houses because they were using the dirt in the streets to like build their adobes. And it was causing big ruts in the streets. And I just thought it was an awesome example of like so the conflict between like American sensibilities and um, like New Mexican practicality. Like people in yeah. New Mexico live like very practical you know and it's like well that's where the best dirt is like that's of course what we would use so I, I i thought that i think i don't know how that will ever come up but i just that was a story that came up recently that i just like it made me chuckle yeah oh i love that i that actually made me think of a question so the elders in my family when they would talk about white americans they would just call them americans did you have you heard that before because I always like I when I first wrote the draft of my novel, like my editor was like, "You're calling, <laughs> you're calling white people Americans, but nobody else." And I was like, "Well, that's what they used to say." And then when I was reading um, "Death yeah. Comes to the Archbishop" by Willa Cather, they referred to people that had just settled, that had just come into the territory as Americans. And I was like, "I think that this is holdover mm -hmm. language from when they got colonized again." I yeah, that, it is. Yeah, it is yeah so when so like so my grandma even she wasn't even that old right like i mean i mean she isn't she wasn't sorry she was born in the 30s but she okay. like she said that her language that she spoke like she spoke mexican that's what she said and and she was taught like not to speak that like that her 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 language wasn't true spanish and she was supposed to be speaking english anyway um <laughs> and so I remember what she told me. So I, I okay. So she would refer to, yeah, because it was like we're New Mexicans, and then the Americans were who came. Yeah. So she did. Yeah. But I don't. Okay. I don't know that she meant it was white people. I think she just meant it was like people not from here. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, because we were up in Denver, and they came to Denver um, in the '30s. So I'm like, it's just fast. Mm -hmm. I just. I haven't been mm -hmm. able to track that and I obviously mm -hmm. have not been able to use it because it's too mm -hmm. nuanced for people yeah. who are like outside of our group to like what are mm -hmm. why are they referring to these Americans but mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. I, I mean I think that shows just how close to colonization we all are like it's it's just right there. It, it, no it's so true because it's like yes yeah, so when they start like when the the Treaty of Guadalupe happened and they and 
this region became the United States, there was a lot of like, Mesilla is now part of Las Cruces, but Mesilla was people who wanted to stay Mexican, Mex- they wanted mm-hmm. it to stay Mexico and Las Cruces was people who wanted it to become the United States. And it had to do a lot with money, um, of course, but, um, and who would give them land or whatever. And who, but unfortunately everyone ended up getting swindled by the Americans. So like, so the people who came in like took land. So that's who they referred to as the Americans. Oh, At interesting. Least it, it, that's what, that's what I, that's how I understand it. That's so interesting. Well, thank you for, thank you. Yeah. Cause I, it's like, every time I meet somebody, I'm like, did you all hear this? Like in your family? So, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, we have yeah. about five more minutes. Uh, okay. oh, yeah. I can answer, I can answer the question really quickly about my ancestor. Yeah. So my yeah, next, my next book will, I believe, like I've already written a number of new short stories that have been published, but I'm like, I think I want to write a novel again. And I want to talk about my family's history after World War II up into the 90s, um, because there was so much growth in the family. Like that was when people started getting educated. Um, That's also when my godfather, um, he was one of the first men in Denver to contract AIDS and died shortly after he baptized me. And Um, I really want to talk about how AIDS devastated my family, because a lot of my a lot of my family is queer. And so we lost a lot of people um, to HIV. And Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, so I've been doing more research, um, pivoting away from the 1800s and the 1930s Mm -hmm. and going post-war. But it's so, you know, I just got to a point where I was making the notes like a couple days ago where I was like, okay, I think there's, I can see something happening. But it's so, mm-hmm. so scary when you start a new project because you're like standing at the abyss. You're like, okay, mm-hmm. let's do it all over again. Um, so mm-hmm. I'm just, I'm, it's my, my birthday's in a couple of weeks. So I'm like Scorpio <gasps> seasoned out. So I'm like, come, oh come use, come visit me. Let's get this book in shape. Um, uh-huh. But yeah, so that'll be that. That'll be the third book in this big Kali Fajardo Einstein universe. <laughs> Ooh, I love that. I think I'm, I'm going to be super interested because I'm actually, I don't know that much about the history of Denver, you know, and like, and, and, and to know more of like the cultural history of it, I think will be pretty interesting. Um, or like this region and how it came. Um, because it seems like in the narrative, in the public narrative, in the common knowledge narrative, it went from like cowboy, um, cowboy railroad town to like uh um techie like millennial town and like we've lost the story in between yeah and before like before the cowboys and then everything in the between then and now like we have these like very romantic ideas of of denver and this region and um yeah i'm so excited about that oh cool well i'm excited like in my next book, you're going to be transported to like jazz clubs and just like underground tea reading, like all kinds of awesome stuff that happened in the 30s. So I can't wait to share that with you. <laughs> so cool. uh, it was so good to talk to you, Carissa. Same, same. And yeah, and thanks for um, being patient with my um, situation that I've got. Of course, <laughs> of course. <laughs> but I'm so glad I got to show you the tree. I mean, that was like, I mean, I... Yeah, I, of course I knew it's there, but like uh, I'm so like, excited we got to see it. Yeah. <laughs> Did you see the virgin? Not yet, but maybe when I okay. sleep and think about the tree, she'll appear to me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both so much for joining us. This is an amazing discussion. I'm definitely a huge fan of both of yours. One of those fans with a complicated ancestral backgrounds as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> And really fun to hear about your upcoming projects. Um, do you have social pages you want to share to our audience uh, just so they can, you know, keep up with your projects that are coming up? Yeah, I can put mine's mine's at my first name, my last name. On I'm on Instagram, and that's my, my that's my website too, CarissaSalmaniego.com. Awesome. Yeah, and I'm I'm on Instagram mostly and Twitter. You can just search my name, and it'll come up. Great. Yeah. Well, we'll try and, and share those in the, in the chat box as well on YouTube. Um, and so everyone can, can follow along. Awesome. Um, great. So yeah, I just wanted to. Thank you so much for. Thank oh, you, Emma. Yeah, thank you for connecting us. This is, this is really nice. Like really great to have this virtual chat and um, have some 
cosmic vibes through the internet waves or whatever, however the internet works, however you get <laughs> waves or energy vibration through the internet. <laughs> yeah, no, thank, thank both of you so much for joining us. And this is, this is really fun to, it was great to see you again, Krista. I feel like I saw you maybe a year ago at this point. Um, yeah. Getting your piece yeah, from storage and, yeah. Um, yeah, it's been great to meet you, Kali, and, and connect. And um, yeah, I'm just gonna thank our sponsors again super quickly, Colorado Community Foundation, the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts, who um, make programming like this possible at Union Hall. And um, we're really excited for the you know next reunion chats coming up. Uh, we'll be posting more about that on our website, www.unionhalldenver.org, and our social media pages, which are at Union Hall Denver. Um, for both Instagram and Facebook. And um, yeah, thank you again for being here and, and I hopefully we'll see you again soon. Awesome. Thanks for having us. Bye, Chris. Bye, Emma. Bye. Have a good night. You Bye. too.